Marketing and communication is not new. It's not a construct of the modern world. The oldest advertising we got is actually 5,000 years old, and we will see in this video where it all started and how it shaped our public institutions. Welcome to Pompeii, the city that was trapped in the ashes of the volcano Vesuvius 2,000 years ago. And what you're looking at is a mural in front of a bar. And what it says is, if you purchase two jars of wine, you get one free. So 2,000 years ago, this is happy hour already. And this is interesting to have a look at this sort of advertising because they didn't change at all. In fact, all this advertising we still have is 5,000 years old. And it's called the Shem Papyrus. The reason it has a good name is because at the time, Egyptologists thought that was a real story about how slaves in Egypt were treated. And the story goes that way. So Apu is a fabric seller. He's selling carpets. And promise on this paper that anyone who would have some information about Shem, his slave that just escaped, if they were to give that information in person in his shop, would receive a gold coin. And at the time, Egyptologists were thinking, oh my God, that's a very clever strategy, so he could uh, get back his slave. But after a while, advertisers started to understand and dig a little bit into the story themselves and, and see that Shem never existed. There was never a slave to begin with. And Apu was just a very clever marketer inviting anyone to come to his shop in exchange of information. Information he would never have to reward because there were no Shem to start with. For advertisers, this sort of tactics is called content marketing. And it's nothing new. It's 5,000 years old, as I said. Not only the advertising itself, but the strategy behind it. Let's uh, dig a little bit into another advertising, in this case, purely visual. Quite interesting because we have to be culturally uh, close to that context to understand it. So you see a footprint on the left. And the advertising says, basically, if your foot is larger than the footprint, and the hole on the top left corner, if your coins can go over that particular hole on the ground, well, turn left, because on the left, there is a brothel. And if you are underage and you don't have money, then turn right, because there is a library. So it's an advertising for a brothel, uh, probably the, the oldest job in the world, and advertising might be the second one. So Ephesus, Turkey, 2,000 years ago, first visual advertising. We continue a little bit more modern times, La Presse in France. So one of the first advertising, a newspaper using advertising as a business model. And what we see is that La Presse soon became not only a newspaper with articles, but a sort of repository of every sort of advertising possible. And what worked really well at the time were health advices, doctors, and all sorts of remedies, all sorts of uh, drugs you could by undercover. There was no real institution checking all, all these medicines, so they tended to advertise everywhere. So a practice which is quite regulated nowadays. But in the US, not in France, we had a similar product that was going in parallel at the same time and called snake oil. You probably heard about snake oil because that's a drug that was supposed to cure everything. And the, the real story goes that Chinese immigrants imported snake oil and, and were actually extracting oil from real snakes. By the, the end of the century, no one used any snake to build the oil. That was a sort of compound of lots of chemical products, and most of them were quite harmful. So the snake oil was sold everywhere with claims you could cure anything. And by 1906, the President Roosevelt uh, signed an act called the Original Food and Drugs Act to sort of regulate these advertising claims and uh, limit the amount of fake information in the medicine sector at that time. So the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, was born at the beginning of the century to counteract the claims in advertising. In Europe, we get the European Medicine Agency, which is still doing the same job. And you can see already the way public institutions are shaped and were born sometimes because the business was getting a little bit crazy. We have another sector which runs in parallel with commercial advertising, and it's called propaganda. Propaganda is 
directly what we do when we communicate for the public sector. The problem is propaganda is not a very nice sentence or, or terminology for that. At the very beginning, it meant the congregation for propagating the faith, which means it was religious. And afterwards, after a little while, it started to apply to any ideology, propagate any ideology. The First World War, in the, especially in the UK, a ministry was even created for propaganda, the Ministry of Information. So it had no pejorative connotation at the time. It was something that the state would do, and in this case, uh, in the UK, to attract soldiers to join the army because there were no mandatory conscription at the time. So they started to placate this sort of posters all around the UK. It worked brilliantly. Britain is fighting for the freedom of Europe. People were enlisting massively. So we have a very good usage of propaganda at the time, trying to fulfill a patriotic idea, a great ideology. But the same tools apply as well to another ideology. And that's particularly the rise of the Nazi party in the 1930s in Europe, where we have the same logic, the same tactic, the same strategy applied to a very disturbing aim. In this case, blaming the Jews uh, all around Nazi Germany. So. Propaganda was born uh, in parallel with commercial advertising and were using the exact same technique. Let's dig into some other landmarks of advertising. Another very interesting movement is Torches of Freedom, 1929, when we started to convince women that smoking was not only something you would consume like a commodity, but you would show to the society you were an equal. You were equal to men, you were demonstrating your femininity, your sophistication. And so Torches of Freedom is a campaign that started to encourage women to think, but by associating it with the ideas of sophistication and freedom. As the president of American Tobacco Company said at the time, it will be like opening a gold mine right in our front yard. Very interesting, as you can see, that moral values and movements are sometimes completely shaped by commercial interest. Edward Bernays, is a favor of public relation or influencing the press to cover a specific event so that you don't have to pay advertising for people to see it. That's public relations. And what you're looking at on the screen is the first time they gave cigarettes to women in the street so that the press would focus on that particular thing, women smoking as an opposition to the traditional society, basically. And Lucky Strike was actually financing these cigarettes. The ideas were coming from women were involved in the voting movement in the US, the suffragette, and, and so we have an amazing mix of public affairs, public relations, uh, moral values, progression of society, all linked to one thing, we want more women to smoke cigarettes because we want to extend our market. Advertising is also responsible for other interesting movements in the world. Uh, Oxidol, it's a detergent for clothes, uh, in the US was produced by Procter & Gamble, and you can see it here. And it gave the name Soap Opera, because at one point Procter & Gamble needed to advertise more, especially on radio, and were thinking of new ways of doing that. So they thought, if we want people to actually listen to our particular advertising every week, why don't we produce a series of shows with a narrative that will continue week after week. And so each time people will hear about this show, they will hear about our brand. So they invented the concept of sitcom, of reality TV, and that is called soap opera. There is also the first commercial uh, on TV in 1941. Quite not interesting. It's actually giving the time to people all across the US, and that was for the brand Bulova. America runs on Bulova time. So what we understand is that commercial advertising and propaganda, which is communication as we call it, always run in parallel to each other and actually fed one each other. If you want to dig into this epic scramble to get inside our heads, I recommend The Attention Merchants, a, a wonderful book. It's very easy to read by Tim Wu. And one chapter is covering commercial brands and the next chapter is covering propaganda and the alternate all along the book. So I would very recommend you that particular uh, purchase if you are interested by, by this whole world. And I give you the next rendezvous next week to dig into the mechanics of this whole world and how we can use it for our own advantage. Thank you very much and see you next week.